are dystopias, because who doesn't love reading about humanity at its worst end? So dystopias, right? Nothing like a little bit of crushing misery. Whoa, wh what's going on? Uh, hello? What are you doing here, Hello Future Me? Uh, I'm not sure. What is happening to my video? Wait, I thought this was my video. Oh my god, our video topics are so similar, YouTube must be bugging out and forcibly mashing them together. Ah, shoot. Well, this is awkward. I guess the YouTube gods have given us no choice but to make this a crossover? Let's do it! To start off, let's do our best to define a typical dystopia so we know exactly what we're dealing with here. At its heart, a dystopia is the opposite of a utopia, which in turn is an imagined ideal society where life is perfect. Dystopias, by contrast, are societies where life sucks across the board. While this is a very loose definition, in practice most dystopias have some very specific recurring features that specify how life sucks. In most cases, dystopias feature a highly militarized police force to keep the populace in line, a strong restriction of speech and thought to fit the agendas of the reigning government, regular shows of force from that government to trump up their image and quash any rebellious ideas before they begin, a restriction of information to the populace in order to keep them ignorant and believing only what the government wants them to believe, and in many cases, the insistence on the part of the government that they are, in fact, a utopia. The bottom line is, it sucks to live in a dystopia, but the dystopian government does its damnedest to convince its citizens that it doesn't, and that even if it does, they have no other options. Dystopias existed in literature before George Orwell published 1984, but 1984 was what really got the genre going. Since then, dystopias have evolved, both in terms of the tropes they invoke and the purpose they serve. Old school dystopias were basically hopeless situations with no happy endings or heroes. The protagonist would be a miserable POV character who served as a way for the audience to see how much this society sucked to live in and how it crushed the life and hope out of our protagonist. More specifically, old school dystopias were usually object lessons, warnings to the reader about how the society they actually lived in could potentially go horribly wrong and what that would look like. This idea goes right back to A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. In 1932, he was warning against a society getting to the point where nobody reads or experiences books anymore. In 1944, Orwell wrote 1984 to reflect the fears of a Stalinist totalitarian society at the time, where instead of people just choosing not to read books, they're banned by the government. In both of these dystopias, people are reduced to empty shells who don't really think or feel anything. They're just left to live their lives watching television, relying on drugs to be happy, and going through the routines of work. Wow, that sounds... Ominous. In 1959, Pat Frank wrote Alas Babylon to see the fears of nuclear annihilation through, just a few years before the Cuban Missile Crisis where the world nearly decided to blow itself up. And in 2012, Sutter wrote The Water Thief to reflect the fears that many have of corporate power as well as rights to things like water, as in can or should you even own water? Likewise, in one of the more famous modern dystopias, The Hunger Games, Collins took how the media trivializes things and the divide between the rich and the poor to the extreme. Each of these reflects the flaws of the society at the time. And there's a reason that readers today tend to understand and fear the societies in these more recent dystopians like Panem and that of the Ackerman Corporation, because they reflect the problems that many see in their own society. This not only helps the reader to empathise more with the characters because they feel that they are going through similar challenges to what they are going through, but it's easier for the reader to immerse themselves in a fictional world if it's inherently founded on the societal, economic or political structures that they see in their own society. You know, just without the good stuff. And just as dystopian stories are made more relatable by connecting it to the ideas in the society of the day, they're often grounded in historical events readers will recognise to give them a sense of realism. There's a reason that Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 is so compelling and terrifying. The story sees thousands of books burned by the government. And not only have things like book burnings happened before in just the last century, but there are still places in the world where reading or owning books about certain topics can lead to imprisonment or even death. These events resonate with the reader, because if they happened before, then why can't they happen again? Necessarily, this often means invoking everybody's favourite dystopian callback, the Nazis. But relying on historical allusions to them to establish the horribleness of your society can lead to a stale and unoriginal story, as A, many stories already allude to similar events, and B, it can come across as being just Nazis in everything but name. Now, readers write in saying that many of the early dystopian protagonists serve to just show how awful these places could be, but then… Pretty early on in their evolution, dystopias started including specific turning points where the POV character realised they were living in a dystopia, triggering a desire to rebel. Where old dystopias just crushed their protagonists, these newer dystopias let their protagonists snap and actually try and do something about it. This also meant that instead of just being POV characters, some of our protagonists were actually allowed to be heroes, the kind of people we as an audience would like to think we'd be in their situation. We also started getting hints of chosen ones with The Matrix, where our hero Neo is exposed to the truth of his simulation reality, 
taken out of the Matrix and brought into a rebel force working to take their dystopic robot oppressors down. His Chosen One status gave them the edge they needed to finally start making a difference towards their goal of freeing humanity, and it ended on a positive, hopeful note that Neo was working to save everyone once and for all. And then there were no sequels. Bummer, right? But now this brings us to the dawn of modern YA dystopia, which pretty much started with Hunger Games, and with it, the advent of heroes instead of just protagonists. With modern dystopias and their focused on heroes instead of depressed POV characters, we also got a change in how those protagonists interacted with the story they were in. For one thing, old school dystopias were usually crushingly static, with nothing ever changing. The misery of the status quo would be the major force making our protagonist feel terrible. They'd reach a breaking point in one way or another and freak out, either rejecting themselves from the society or getting forcibly crushed back into place. But there's a very strong tendency in writing for modern heroes to be dragged into the plot rather than really choosing anything of their own volition. And this means modern dystopias force our heroes to confront the problems with their society rather than just crushing them down and daring them to kick up a fuss. This is usually done one of two ways. Either your dystopian society has some ironclad standard for what everyone must be like, but your hero doesn't fit into those categories and is therefore brought into conflict with the society as soon as this specialness is discovered. Or your dystopia has some nasty battle royale style challenge your hero is unwittingly dragged into and they have to fight to survive and come to terms with the dispassionate evil of the society they thought would keep them safe. In either case, our hero rapidly loses faith in the system. Sometimes, to amp up the shock factor, this hero would have previously advocated heavily for the system until it turned on them. Basically, where old school dystopias are a slow burn that gradually crushes our hapless POV character under the weight of a dispassionate, miserable society, modern dystopias happen a lot faster and change much more drastically. Though this is where authors run into one of the things they need to be careful of when writing dystopian stories. Passive characters. Generally speaking, characters are either going to be more passive or more active. Active means that they make decisions that change the direction of the story, while passive means that they react to the events of the story. There's a reason that we love V from V for Vendetta. He's an active dystopian character whose actions directly create the course of events leading up to the protests of Parliament at the climax. From the destruction of the Old Bailey to taking on Evie, he's more interesting because of that. In contrast, Offred from The Handmaid's Tale is a relatively passive dystopian character. She's dragged into the plot as a fertile woman, and spends much of the story reacting to the decisions of those controlling it, i.e. the aunts and the commander. Candace Everdeen is another example. She spends much of her story just reacting to the decisions of President Snow, the capital, and his merry band of hairdos. It's only nearer the end that she becomes more interesting, as her personal decision to eat the berries forces the capital to react to her. And there isn't anything exactly wrong with having characters who are passive, but it does present a unique challenge for writers that they need to be wary of. This being that having the dystopian society force the protagonist to act can make the reader feel like the decisions of the protagonist are disconnected from who they are as a character. Rather than having their values, beliefs, or personal relationships decide what they do, it's these external forces of a government or a corporation that dictates where they go in the story. Dystopian storytelling with this much emphasis on the society being being terrible and oppressive can make it difficult to give characters agency, to make them interesting, or to give emotional weight to the decisions or losses of the protagonist, because they don't really arise from any conviction or fault of the character themselves. But in the cases where the hero does get personally invested and actively tries to resist the dystopia rather than just getting dragged around by the plot, a major change from old school to new dystopias becomes clear. Since the protagonists are getting increasingly heroic, sometimes they're actually allowed to win. Old dystopian societies would usually present the illusion of permanence, with the strong implication, or explicit epilogue informing the audience, that the dystopic government didn't manage to last very long. But modern dystopias let the heroes actually defeat the dystopian government and make way for a brighter future. And this change has brought with it the challenge of realism. Just as dystopias often arise from complex societal problems that we see in the real world today, societies also fall apart for complex political, social, environmental, and economic reasons. Many can come across as simplistic to say that all it needs is for the hero to lead a generic rebellion to overthrow the oppressors, and voila, they've made their country great again. In The Handmaid's Tale, our glorious theocratic patriarchal dystopia is falling apart within the first decade of its beginning, because it proves pretty difficult to keep wives happy when their husbands are meant to be having kids with other women. The book even ends with what's implied to be a revolution. It's not falling apart simply because people think it's evil, it's falling apart because of the particular problems that that kind of dystopia would create. Either exploring these issues in the story itself, or connecting the downfall of the dystopia to the intrinsic problems that that society creates makes for a more convincing and interesting story by acknowledging that the problems of that society are more than just 
evil, that they arise from human nature. Following on from this, it's a common pitfall for dystopian stories to not explore the ramifications of a revolution in the post-war scenario. Who takes over? What form of government will that be? These are difficult questions. Stories like The Hunger Games at least acknowledge these complexities when Katniss chooses to kill President Coyne instead of President Snow. Revolution often leads to new dictators or retribution against the oppressors, and she was trying to avoid that. Now one thing we have to address when analyzing any trope is, what exactly is the point of all this? Why do people write dystopias? Well in general there are two major reasons. One, as we discussed earlier, dystopias serve as excellent warnings and social commentary. If a writer sees something in their society that they think is dangerous or evil or could potentially go terrifyingly wrong if allowed to spiral out of control, all they need to do is crank that social thing up to 11, world build the dire consequences, and slap an introspective protagonist in there to sorrowfully contemplate how terrible life in this society is. Though this definitely isn't a requirement for a dystopia, Children of Men is a very effective dystopia without explicitly being a big flashing warning sign. It's just frequently a major motivator behind the creation of one. A dystopia can stand on its own even without being directly relevant to modern society, as evinced by the fact that old dystopias have remained effective despite their warnings in many cases no longer being obviously relevant to our society. The other major reason people are motivated to write dystopias is misery porn. Dystopias suck, and any characters you put in a dystopia will have lives that suck in one way or another. Do you want to write something mindlessly miserable and torment your characters with increasingly improbable BS? There's no better way to do that than to stick them in an irrationally terrible environment with nonsensical rules and punishments and go to town. Though this soon takes the reader from worrying about the flaws that they recognize in their own society that they also see in the dystopia to questioning, wait, what? How would this happen? This doesn't even make sense. And when a dystopia loses that relationship between it and society or history, it undermines the themes, ideas, or character arcs behind that, because those are being explored in a context that doesn't feel believable or relatable for the reader. So there are a lot of pros when writing dystopias. They're emotionally draining, they make you think about the state of the world and your place in it, stuff like that. But there's something of a glaring weakness in dystopias, and that's the characters. The fact is, characters in general shine when given the chance to exist in multiple contexts. Some of the most interesting stories involve examining a character out of their usual element, and there are tons of fun tropes centered on characters surprising you by rising to a challenge they don't normally face. But dystopias are by design monotonous. Modern dystopias might be more chaotic and overall flexible, but the core purpose of a dystopia is to crush you with a monolithic sense of static unpleasantness. It's a monochrome, monotone society where nothing ever gets better, and in most cases your characters aren't allowed the freedom to try anything new, because most dystopias classify anything new and interesting as probably treason, so you'd better not risk it. This means your characters don't get to exist in any new or interesting contexts or show off interesting facets of their personality, and this leaves most dystopias with a general vibe that the protagonist doesn't matter, nobody matters, you don't matter, and nobody really gets the privilege of being unique or interesting because everything sucks. Even a hero in a modern dystopia who's abruptly forced out of their comfortable life and into conflict with the man will exist in only two capacities, sheeple and desperately struggling to survive in a world they barely understand. And neither of those really let us get to know them as a person. Now this isn't really a design flaw, as it's probably one of the most important tone-setting elements of a dystopia, that this society crushes individuality and who you are as a person doesn't matter in the face of overwhelming monolithic force. But it does mean that character-driven storytelling kind of flounders in the context of a dystopia. Dystopian storytelling is optimized for an examination of the world, not the people who live in it. But while this is true, that doesn't mean that you can't have multi-dimensional dystopian characters with interesting character arcs. The formula of taking a flaw in society and exaggerating it can be a useful way to develop a character arc because ultimately, these stories are just about a society with problems. But more importantly, they're about how we as individuals perceive and interact with those problems. This is why characters who go from accepting or even supporting the regime to defying or escaping it are so fascinating. In Lois Lowry's story, The Giver, the main character, Jonas, starts off believing the community is a good place to be, a society that has eliminated pain, hunger, conflict, all that bad stuff. But in doing so, humanity chose to give up even the ability to feel things like anger, lust, extreme happiness, or love. Throughout the course of the story, Jonas realizes the importance of these feelings to being human, both the good and the bad. These weren't just flaws in society, but in himself, and by the end of the story, he's an entirely different person. And the backstory of Rosemary shows that it's hard to accept that we need these things to be human. This is really effective. The reader empathizes more with Jonas's journey because Lowry uses the desires and fears that every person has. We want to eradicate pain and suffering, but we also know that we need to mature and find our own path. 
And it's through Jonas's development that Lowry speaks to the reader as well. Connecting a character arc to the world building means that the society the author builds is more than just a backdrop with a sign that says, this is a bad place to live. Instead, it feels more like the growth in their character evolves naturally from the environment that they're in. But even living in a monotonous world, characters can still have complex feelings and beliefs about things, and exploring these can make it feel like your character's thoughts do matter, despite the looming grey of your dystopia. In V for Vendetta, EV society gave up their freedom in exchange for security, and as EV grows throughout the story, she goes from supporting the regime to leading its overthrow, coming to value freedom and liberty over security and safety. Her character change is intimately tied to the issues of the type of dystopia that she lives in, and that change allows her to experience love, happiness, awe, and deep personal fulfillment. By using the character arc to take them through these different experiences, to feel new things, an author can build a multi-dimensional character and allow the reader to see them in varying situations. Though there is an interesting trope that many dystopian stories have used to help with this, that despite the monotonous horribleness of it all, a character still has some small thing that gives them a reprieve from the horribleness. In Wally, -E, that's a small plant in the desolate wasteland. In V for Vendetta, V has an old jukebox full of music that he dances to, and in The Hunger Games, Katniss has a special place in the woods outside District 12 that she can escape to. Not only do these little elements allow us to see characters experience things other than fear, depression, and hopelessness, but they can often be used as motivators by giving them something personal to recall and protect. The contrast between a hopeless world and a hopeful character is a very valuable writing tool, and providing a character with a small get out of misery free card is a good way to alleviate or even remove the aforementioned character crushing misery of a dystopia. However, this can sometimes play into another recurring problem in dystopic fiction, which is a sort of tone clash, where the world is an overwhelmingly hopeless and terrible place that's painted as a monolithic indestructible entity that crushes individuality and all things good in the world, but the story focus is a quirky young adult inexplicably wielding the power to take the dystopia down. The worst offender in these stories is dystopic romance plotlines, where the dystopia that by all rights should be the biggest antagonistic force in the story is eclipsed by the burning question of which cute boy our spunky heroine should make out with today. Basically, this is what happens when the characters aren't aren't developed in the context of the story. Rather than living in, coping with, and ultimately fighting against the world they're established in, they're basically acting with it as a backdrop to their personal character drama, which can kind of make the dystopia feel toothless or generally non-threatening if the biggest narrative threat is the looming specter of romantic subplots. And this is intimately tied to how you structure your dystopian story. Where an author puts emphasis, shifts in tone, and which order your events are placed in largely determines where the tension of the story comes from and which threads of your story will have the most impact on the reader. And it's not uncommon for the setup of the story in the first and second act to place emphasis and create suspense from the inescapable, crushing, dystopian society as their friends and family are turned to dust and all happiness is drained from the world. But then, the setup isn't met with follow through in the third act. Instead, the tension in the third act is sometimes derived equally, or even more so, from the subplot, often romantic, rather than the dystopian setting. This can be jarring, because deciding how you frame the climactic point of tension is crucial. If that point only resolves the dystopian dramatic thread, then it reinforces the themes and character development that's dependent on that thread. But if the climactic point is used to resolve the subplot, or even that and the dystopian dramatic thread at the same time, it can feel clumsy because the narrative is treating the dystopian themes, ideas, and character development that come from that as equally or less important than the romantic story or the subplot. Instead, resolving the romantic story after the high point of tension or resolving it beforehand can help prevent that dissonance. It's also important to think about just how much page time your character spends doing the he loves me, he loves me not, compared to thinking about the whole, oh yeah, I live in a society where people are turned to dust just because they have blue eyes. That's right. A great subversion of this is in 1984, which has both a dystopian setting thread and a romantic thread between Winston and Julia. While both threads evolve alongside one another, Orwell structured the story to see that the setting heavy thread was what primarily gave tension to the climax, where Winston is imprisoned and tortured for opposing the government and he has to try and resist brainwashing. In fact, the story ends on a dark note with Winston betraying Julia under interrogation of the government. Part of the reason that 1984 is so effective is that Orwell actively subverts the emphasis we place on romantic stories. He asserts that the pressures of the setting thread are so bad as to eliminate love entirely, and it's in that 
that we see how pervasive this dystopia is. But the collision between character and setting isn't restricted to dystopic romantic subplots. There's actually a very pervasive issue in the more modern dystopic hero stories that arises when your protagonist displays the ability to change the world and topple the regime and stuff, but does so without adequate explanation as to why they're capable of doing what nobody before them has managed to do. Old dystopias never fell apart in the timeline of the story, so this problem never arose, but with the advent of proper heroes in these settings, sometimes it feels too easy for these characters to throw off the chains of oppression and launch a counterattack to take down the elderly white person holding the reins of the regime. As we've discussed pretty thoroughly at this point, dystopias suck to live in and do a very good job of crushing any and all deviants from the acceptable norm in order to retain their absolute power, so it can be jarring when your quirky YA protagonist happily deviates from the norm midway through Act 1 with no lasting issues and easily rallies a squad of young, attractive, like-minded individuals to a shockingly quick victory. The question is always, why didn't anybody do this earlier? And the answer is usually implied to be, oh, well, you know, everyone was just so downtrodden and miserable and stuff, so nobody ever tried, or at least nobody ever got far enough for it to really matter, which loops right back to the starting question, what makes our hero different from everyone else? In really classic hero stories, the knight succeeds in slaying the dragon because they're the first person to try who's strong enough or prepared enough or possesses enough magical backup to pull it off. But in dystopias, focus is frequently put on how this YA hero is just a normal person. If they're just like everyone else, why are they the one who had zero problem with actually fighting back? This problem is nowhere near universal. It's more of an easy pitfall for writers to run into when they're trying to simultaneously stress that their hero is just a normal kid, and that they're doing extraordinary things, and that their society is just the worst, you guys, like it's so terrible that nobody's ever done anything like this before. These pieces don't fit together easily, and when they're stuck together carelessly, you end up with this dissonance in the storytelling, where the terribleness of the dystopia is more informed than demonstrated, since our everyman POV character seems to be totally immune to its awfulness and topples the whole thing in under a thousand pages with nothing but a ragtag bunch of hot young misfits and a couple inspiring speeches. So, what have we discussed on dystopian stories? First off, dystopian stories tend to be relatable because they draw on historical fears along with more modern concerns about the decay of society, with old school dystopias tending to be object lessons explicitly warning the audience away from the future it promises. Though this comes with the corresponding problem that relying too heavily on historical illusions can lead to an aesthetically unoriginal story where the bad guys are basically just Nazis in funky hats. Secondly, modern dystopias tend to drag the heroes or protagonists into action by having them not conform to whatever standard society requires. Though relying on this too much can create passive characters who tend to be less interesting as their decisions can be disconnected from who they are as characters. Thirdly, modern dystopias have started allowing the heroes to win, but it's generally more engaging to give the dystopia a realistic reason to collapse, whether it be military, societal, economic, or otherwise. And it can be interesting to address what happens after this major power is no longer there to regulate society. Fourthly, dystopias serve as excellent warnings and social commentary about the worst of society and humanity, but a major danger to this is misery porn, where the reader becomes no longer immersed because they don't feel the society could actually come to be in any way. Fifthly, one downside is that dystopian stories make it difficult to explore complex characters in a variety of contexts, but the setup can facilitate interesting character arcs where the flaws in society are the flaws in the characters, and so they have to overcome that. It also lets you connect your character arc to your world building. Sixthly, a major pitfall to be aware of is that too heavy a focus on a subplot, often romantic, means that the whole dystopia doesn't feel threatening, because the real threat is losing your six foot dark haired dark eyed eye candy. It's also critical to think about how you structure your third act in dealing with this dissonance. Seventhly, having your protagonist solving all the world's problems and leaving the revolution like no one's ever done before can be jarring for the reader if there's no real reason they can do it when nobody else could. Your POV character can't be immune to the horribleness of the world, or it detracts from the horribleness of the world. But that's all from me. This has been really great, right? We'll have to do it again sometime. Bye. Whoop. All right, see you later, man. So, yeah.